We have with us today Musa Algarbi, who is a graduate student in sociology at Columbia University, member of Heterodox Academy, and um, he's written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Atlantic, Foreign Affairs. He is self-described as the Kanye West of sociology, <laughs> which I, 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 I'm looking forward to seeing how that pans out. Um, his talk today will be Institutions and the Means of Knowledge Production. After he speaks, we'll be hearing from Nicola de Jager, whose name I cannot pronounce, and I apologize. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in polit political science at Stellenbosch University, author of South Africa is in Danger of Becoming a Radicalized Society Again, an article from 2015, um, just to, to, to timestamp that. And her talk today will be The Age of Conformity, Reflections on Academic Freedom in South Africa. Lisa, take it away. Sure. So, um, I, I was going to talk maybe a little bit about how I became interested in this work. It's a fun, exciting story. Uh, maybe if someone asks me about it during the Q&A or whatever, I can dive into it. But actually, um, uh, time is a little short, so I want to just kind of start by diving right into it. So I want to start with um, this, this quote here. Uh, the appeal to social justice has by now become the most widely used and most effective argument in political discussion. Almost every claim for government action on behalf of particular groups is made in its name. And if it can be made to appear that a certain measure is demanded by social justice, opposition to it will rapidly weaken. It seems to be widely believed that social justice is just a new moral value which we can add to those already recognized in the past and that it can be fitted within the existing framework of moral rules. What is not sufficiently recognized is that in order to give this phrase meaning, a complete change of the whole character of the social order will have to be affected and that some of the values which used to govern it will have to be sacrificed. It is such a transformation of society into one of a fundamentally different type which is currently occurring piecemeal and without awareness of the outcome um, to which it must lead. So this sounds like something that could have been written maybe in an outlet like Quillette sometime last week or something. In fact, it was written in 1976 by Hayek in his The Mirage of Social Justice. Similarly, consider this one. Um, Leftists have helped put together such academic disciplines as women's history, black history, gay studies, Hispanic American studies, and migrant studies. This has led Stef uh, Stefan Colino to remark that in the United States, the term cultural studies really means victim studies. Colino's choice of phrase has been resented, but he was making a good point, namely that such programs were created not out of a sort of curiosity about the diverse forms of human life which give rise to cultural anthropology, but rather to do something for people who have been humiliated, to help victims of socially acceptable forms of sadism by making such sadism no longer acceptable. This sounds like it was something written about, you know, again, pretty recently about the grievance study scandal. This was actually from uh, pragmatist philosopher Richard Rorty's 1996 um, book, uh, Achieving Our Country. So uh, again, um, these are uh, long-standing uh, issues. Some, a lot of the things that we're talking about today are very long-standing. Uh, one of the things that people have, and this is going to be partly the, the subject of, of my talk today. So a number of people, for instance, have been curious about the origins of um, victimhood and how it became um, such a laudable thing to be a victim or the sort of... Uh, unimpeachable nature of testimony or subjective experience that seems to be kind of uh, growing more and more common, the popularization of the term trauma. Here are three excellent books on this. Um, the first one by Fasten and Rechtman was very prescient, written in 2009, called The Empire of Trauma. And basically, um, the argument that they lay out is that the term trauma first became popularized, uh, of course, looking at the case of war and soldiers in the aftermath of war. Um, but even as late as the, the first two world, world wars, the term trauma was greeted with like deep skepticism by psychologists. Um, it was widely thought that people appealed to trauma as a way of explaining sort of weaknesses in their own character, excusing weaknesses in their own character, like why it was that they couldn't cope with war the same way as real men, all the other men who didn't seem to be traumatized or whatever, and, um, and or that it was a cynical ploy by people to avoid having to deploy back to combat or, or things like this. This is how a lot of psychologists understood appeals to trauma. And so this, this is what actually motivated the sort of um, move among a certain subset of psychologists to really prize 
um, the testimony of people who were affected by trauma and, this, uh, uh, and the subjective nature of the traumatic encounter and stuff like this. So a lot of these um, tendencies that we find frustrating today and that have been carried to excess, uh, this is basically the origin of that move. Um, and then what happened over time, of course, is that the um, uh, trauma moved out of just being something that, uh, it, so basically it wasn't until uh, after the Vietnam War that trauma became taken seriously. Uh, and it was officially put in the DSM in 1980, so again, like, uh, after the Vietnam. And, um, and then over time, the concept became applied to, a, a, you know, an ever wider range of things. So at first, it was things like um, people who suffered at the hands of terrorists or whatever. 9-11 was actually kind of a game changer for making trauma more widely acceptable. Um, so victims of terror attacks, victims of sexual assaults, um, survivors of natural disasters, right? But then it just keeps expanding and eventually it becomes uh, things like microaggressions or people like looking at Confederate statues and things like that that can be traumatized, which is a totally different kind of character. Um, but, um, but this is a great book for understanding the rise of that. Uh, another set of sociologists, Bradley Campbell, Jason Manning, a book that I would highly recommend is called The Rise of Victimhood Culture. And uh, so basically what they do is they contrast three different sort of cultural paradigms, uh, a dignity culture, uh, an honor culture, and victimhood culture. And uh, the, the sort of noteworthy contribution of this text is to sort of specify some of the conditions under which uh, victimhood culture would sort of take root and become popular. It's very like theoretically useful in that regard, so I would recommend it. And then the final one, um, Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psych uh, by Ethan Waters. And uh, what, what, what's the sort of novel contribution of this work is to show that the stakes of a, a lot of these issues um, extend well beyond the United States and Western Europe. Uh, what this book shows is that a lot of the idiosyncrasies of the uh, current American and Western European situation are spilling into a lot of other countries around the world and they're adopting a lot of the sort of um, psychologized framework uh, that we appeal to. But it's not just uh, trauma and victimhood. So pretty much anything that we want that, that people talk about today, sensitivity training began in 1946. The, the concept of institutional racism dates back to 1967. Microaggressions to 1974. Cultural appropriation, 1976. Critical race theory, um, uh, first in 1981 and 1987 is really one. Um, intersectionality, 1980, 1989. The idea that words are violence, 1987. Safe spaces starting in the 60s. Trigger warnings, again, starting in the 80s. So all of these things that we're talking about, none of these things that we're talking about today are things that came about <coughs> suddenly in 2014 through 2016 or something like that. All of these concepts and paradigms were um, established over by decades of institutionalization and activism um, across decades. And this is important to understand. And some other things that are important to understand looking at the list of, uh, of these um, people and the process by which this came about. A lot of these people are associated with elite institutions. We're, we're associated with elite institutions like the Ivies, the public Ivies, schools like MIT and Stanford and stuff like this as well. Um, and so sometimes it's argued that people who are concerned about these issues sort of overemphasize the elite schools. And the narrative is basically that, you know, the, the, the challenges are less severe and just different at schools like public, at sort of um, public land grant universities and community colleges, and, um, and that, the, that these elite schools are not representative in many respects of what happens at, at most colleges and universities nationwide. And that's true, and it's important to keep that in mind. <laughs> but at the same time, what happens at elite schools do matter a lot uh, for a few reasons. One, because they produce a radically disproportionate share of all faculty nationwide. So when you look at uh, all tenured and tenure track faculty nationwide, um, it's something like 70% of, of tenured and tenure track faculty hail from like 20% of the elite schools or something like that. If you don't come from one of these schools, it's difficult, not impossible in the United States, but difficult to get a tenured or tenure track position in the current atmosphere. So they, they do shape sort of the faculty sort of, uh, psychology or whatever, nationwide. Um, they also set the research paradigm for a lot of other, um, for, for most fields and, and scholars. Uh, and um, also the policy uh, 
framework. So schools consistently, everyone wants to be like Harvard or Chicago or MIT or whatever. So if Harvard passes some rule um, or, or, or policy or whatever, it becomes likely that, all of these, that a lot of these other schools um, will adopt it. Um, so what happens in elite schools matter. And most of these um, ideas uh, that people are annoyed with today or that have been carried to excess, uh, again, uh, have their origins in elite schools. Another thing that's important to note is that <coughs> the humanities and social sciences are usually the ones that receive flack for a lot of these concepts. But when you actually look at how most of these concepts came about, it wasn't through like humanities or social scientists or armchair theorists or whatever. It was actually mostly practitioners and legal scholars that um, practitioners in various fields like psychology and legal scholars that gave rise to all of this. So critical race theory, for instance, there is this movement called critical legal studies that emerged in the 70s. The rough assumption was that the law basically serves to entrench the status quo and protect the powerful. And so they were going to take a revisionist and activist approach to the law that was going to serve the disempowered. This was the foundation of the critical legal studies movement and offshoot of that looking at specifically issues of, of race, um, started by Derrick Bell in 1981, but which really came to, became a like, more robust movement in 1987, um, is basically how critical race theory came about. Even the idea that words are violence was something that was put forward by a lawyer, not a, not a, not a, um, not a again, a theorist or humanities person, a lawyer, Catherine McKinnon, uh, starting with her book, Feminism Unmodified in 1987, and then sort of being developed more and more in some of her um, later works and then sort of culminating with her only words in 1993. Very influential set of arguments that she was making and it's the source of this um, sort of ubiquitous notion now that words are violence. Um, and you can go on and on. Um, and so, it, uh, so in many respects, the sort of grievance studies um, uh, fields and stuff are not the driver of the problem. In some respects, they're a symptom of the problem. They're a product of these trends by practitioners and, um, and legal scholars and stuff uh, and, and the innovations and arguments that they were making. And understanding that it was largely practitioners and legal scholars also helps explain uh, how, how they were institutionalized so effectively. And I want to talk a little bit about specifically how a lot of these ideas and concepts and paradigms were institutionalized. So first, um, they were institutionalized through setting up tenure lines, degree programs, and interdisciplinary centers, um, as uh, explained well by uh, Fabio Rojas from Black Power to Black Studies. Um, second, they entrenched, uh, they developed curricula to try to um, advance these key ideas and approaches and entrench themselves in ed schools, uh, as, as has been talked about a few times um, and described well and Lyle Asher's How Ed Schools Became a Menace in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Then they moved into university administration and expanded the domain of, um, and radically expanded the sort of size of the administration and the, the sort of scope of administration. Um, and uh, so when you look at the growth of administration from 1989 to the present, it's astonishing, and of course, as many of you know, in many schools now, the, the administrators outnumber the faculty. Most new job growth in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of universities is administration rather than faculty. Even as faculty lines are being cut, they're bringing in like, uh, you know, ever more lines of administrators. Um, and, uh, and, and, and as has been mentioned before by Noah Carl, a radical share of, radically disproportionate share of these administrators hail from the humanities and social sciences which are um, the fields that have, again, adopted a lot of these frameworks set by the legal, um, legal scholars and practitioners in the past. Um, and then finally, they developed professional um, associations and um, also through things like departmental service, serving on committees for hiring and promotion, and et cetera. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But what's striking is around the same time that these ideas were being developed and institutionalized, there was also a movement afoot to um, that's basically uh, the precursor to the viewpoint diversity um, movement, and which basically argued that um, the prevailing discourse suffered from a whole bunch of biases, blind spots, and limitations um, that emphasized the political <coughs> dimensions of knowledge production and that called for viewpoint diversity as a corrective um, for these problems in both teaching and scholarship. And there were sort of two um, two kind of big approaches to this. 
one that focused on identity commitments, and one that focused on partisan, um, or, uh, partisan commitments or political ideology, um, one uh, that's more associated with the humanities, another that came to be associated more with the humanities, even though a lot of the people who developed it were social scientists, another that was sort of more, more firmly remained in social science. Um, and so uh, I'll, walk through the, uh, I'll walk through some of this very briefly. Um, so it began with the history in class consciousness, um, which basically argued that the, the powerful or the ones, uh, the, the sort of um, powerful are the ones who shape a lot of the prevailing narratives and our understanding of a lot of social phenomenon, and it's important to basically have um, uh, history in this case, but you know, social phenomenon more generally um, told from the perspective of the proletariat or whatever. Um, and then, uh, sort of, the, this is followed by uh, starting in 1949 with the second sex um, arguments of similarly about how. Um, the prevailing discourse, which is done, uh, you know, made strictly by men to understand <laughs> a lot of social issues, is incomplete and in some ways sort of self-serving and biased or whatever. And that, w uh, so this is what, like a subtext of, of the argument there, um, that one way is that in order to get a more complete understanding of a lot of issues, you actually need, you know, um, interplay and exchange between the female and male perspectives. Um, and this was developed, really came into, a, a, this idea really came into its, um, into full in 1975 with Smith, Women Look at Psychology, which was, the which was the sort of beginning point of standpoint feminism, standpoint feminist, standpoint epistemology, um, which was developed <coughs> more rigorously or more fully in her 1997 Feminism and Marxism. Um, you saw another movement that was looking at issues of like race and ethnicity, basically, and the ways that um, that, uh, that, that can affect um, our understanding of social issues, so beginning with Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, um, followed by Ted Allen. Uh, so the idea, of, so Ted Allen um, is the one who came up with the concept of white privilege um, and uh, the idea of denaturalizing whiteness and dismantling white supremacy and formed the basis of what's now known as white studies. Again, 1967, right? <laughs> this is not, um, uh, and then you had like Paulo Freire, uh, uh, the pedagogy of the oppressed, um, Edward Said's Orientalism, and what what all of the the thread that runs through all of those is the idea that you need an interplay again between the dominant perspectives and the subaltern perspectives in order because the dominant perspectives are largely self-serving and they serve to <coughs> pathologize and exoticize the other um, and um, and sort of legitimize the status quo, and so you. And so it wasn't the case that these people were arguing that the only people who had anything meaningful to say were people from subaltern groups, that you know, uh, white people had nothing valuable to say about or, or whatever, or that anything that someone of color said was you know, automatically true in virtue of their identity. Or, like, there are sort of ridiculous interpretations of this which are growing more common, unfortunately. But this was not the argument that any of these people were making. Um, <laughs> they were mostly arguing that you need an interplay between dominant and subaltern perspectives in order to have a clear understanding of a lot of social phenomenon. And then you saw the people like Foucault and Derrida um, in the, in the um, mid to late 60s and Gramsci in early 71, uh, was one that was translated to English anyway, a lot of his works, um, that uh, highlighted how Things like language and discourse sort of reveal a lot of important things about power relations. And again, um, in the case of Foucault, looking at how the, the very product of knowledge production um, is, 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 is like intimate, intimately bound up with power. Um, starting in the 80s, you see a couple of intersectional approaches um, to this. The, again, the, the notion of intersectionality really gets started in the 80s. So you have Zinn's A People's History of the United States, which was a deeply flawed work in many respects, but the sort of n noteworthy contribution here is that it f folded together the idea of the sort of class approach along with the race and gender approach to, to basically argue that in order to understand a lot of contemporary, uh, a lot of the phenomenon, you need to look at these subaltern perspectives and put them in conversation with the dominant ones. Although he, anyway, uh, <laughs> and then you saw the emergence of queer theory beginning in the 1980s too, beginning with Adrian Rich's compulsory heterosexuality and the lesbian experience. And then the 1990s were a banner year, people like Butler, Sedgwick, um, uh, Halperin. And then the term queer theory is first coined in 1991 
uh, queer theory and lesbian studies. And then on the flip side of this, the more social science side, you have Polanyi arguing in 1958, basically looking at how the uh, personal knowledge, how the um, commitments of, how the sort of personal commitments and ideologies of um, social uh, of scientists inform uh, both the objects of study and how they pursue their study, et cetera. 1965, you see the first study of the kind that Sam Abrams did, that Noah, uh, Noah Carl cited, or uh, people like Langbert. So the political orient orientations of the academically affiliated psychologists. Um, Janus, 72, victims of groupthink, looked at how um, uh, ideological homogeneity undermined the, like, effective policy making and caused a lot of disasters. Uh, 1975, you see your first audit, of some of your first audits of the peer review looking at um, how ideological factors relate to a paper getting you know, approved or not approved, Ab Abramowitz, Gomez and Abramowitz is one of these sort of landmark ones. Um, then you see similar audits of institutional review boards such as by Ceci Peters and Plotkin in 1985. Um, and uh, you know, on and on through the present day and the emergence of, uh, oh, another important one to note actually is 2011 Yancey Compromising Scholarship looks at how sort of religious perspectives are um, not taken seriously and uh, undervalued in social research and some of the consequences of that. Um, and what's, what's striking though, uh, the reason why this sort of, what's striking when you compare th th this movement with the previous one, even though they both emerged in the same time, this movement was not institutionalized uh, nearly as effectively <laughs> as the previous one. And part of the reason is that the identity commitment people, the partisan political ideology commitment people, so whereas when you look at um, a lot of these concepts, uh, like microaggressions and trauma, um, uh, intersectionality, the idea that words are violent, safe spaces, trigger warnings, these were all applied in a very sort of ecumenical way. So a lot of this stuff began with like microaggressions or something that began looking specifically at race, right? But then it was adopted by people talking about gender, by people talking about sexuality, by people talking about, you know, also a whole range of disability, you know, on and on and on. Um, uh, ditto with um, trigger warnings or safe spaces or any of these, uh, the ideas of words <coughs> or violence, right? So they, they were um, very ecumenical in how a lot of these things were um, used and applied. Whereas um, the viewpoint diversity sort of movement was not nearly as ecumenical. The identity um, commitments, people who are focusing on identity commitment and the people who are looking at sort of partisan political ideology were... Um, uh, this crowd was pretty skeptical of this crowd uh, <laughs> and still are. Uh, in many cases, um, there was not a lot of sort of cross-fertilization or engagement uh, sort of across these lines. Um, that was part of the problem. And also there was not a great, um, uh, there was not a nearly as robust of an effort to sort of institutionalize these findings in a meaningful way within um, colleges and universities uh, and or, or even the broader public in, in nearly the same degree as, as the um, other trends. Uh, so I want to pull a couple lessons from this um, briefly. Um, so one, uh, one, one thing that we need to take away, that we can take away from looking at how a lot of these things came about and were developed is that this is a long-term thing. So it took generations of activism and institutionalization for a lot of these things to be created and, uh, and to, to take the sort of prominence they have today in the first place. The excesses are not going to be uh, you know, corrected in a year or two. <laughs> this is going to be a long-term process to roll some of this back or, or, or correct it. Um, uh, and um, people need to go into it with that kind of mindset that this is a process of institutional change and reform that's going to take time and discipline. Um, there, are not, there are not really any shortcuts or magic bullets. You're not going to pass any kind of resolution at, at uh, the sort of local level or pass some kind of law that's going to magically create viewpoint diversity or constructive disagreement or whatever. Um, these are, uh, because these are fundamentally issues of um, culture, which you can't like, legislate top down. And, um, and again, like they were, a lot of these things were created through sort of organic grassroots evolution over time and um, advocacy and adaptation and whatever and that's probably how our movement is also going to have to <laughs> succeed and, and grow. Um, uh, it's important, um, so 
I, I think a lot of people who support heterodoxy need to strongly consider earlier forms of intervention before college as well. So some people who support the promotion of viewpoint diversity or heterodoxy or et cetera should consider actually working at teachers' colleges um, rather than just seeding them to, um, <coughs> to, uh, to the crowd that currently dominates them or consider other earlier interventions. Um, this is one of the insights of, like, so for instance, um, Heterodox Academy's co-founder John Haidt um, wrote a book called Coddling of the American Mind that some of you may be familiar with. And one of the things that he realized in, in um, researching the book is that initially when he started Heterodox Academy, his thinking was that students were arriving to campus um, kind of w without any of, any of this baggage and the, you know, they came to campus eager to learn and grow and um, open-minded and, 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 and all of this. And then basically professors shoved all this stuff down their gullets and transformed them from you know, nice, reasonable people into radical SJWs out to, or in victims and whatever, right? Was, um, was sort of the earlier paradigm that's, that um, he initially kind of went into this working with. But then what he realized is actually that a lot of students are coming to campus with a lot of these ideas, pretty, f pretty, f um, the sort of therapeutic uh, aspect, the sort of emphasis on victimhood and trauma, this kind of stuff, that students come to campus with this stuff already baked in that they picked up in their primary school from teachers because, again, as mentioned, a lot of these people um, um, have uh, really uh, ingrained themselves into teachers' colleges and things like this, it, by w and through this, they shape just ordinary teachers who are teaching, you know, sort of nationwide. Um, so uh, by the time they get to college, it, they're not, it's not a hopeless cause by the time they get to college, but it's a much more difficult lift. And so um, earlier interventions in the process might help a great deal. Uh, and so John uh, created one such initiative called Let Grow that I can't go into a lot right now because, you know, time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so just two, uh, a, a couple quick things. Um, Consider things like um, becoming part of the administration or university leadership as the institution arrives. Serve on editorships, serve as journal reviewers, serve on committees for hiring, promotion, grad students, whenever the opportunity arises, mentor people. Um, things like curricula, working groups, etc. cetera. Um, and actually in the discussion, if someone reminds me, uh, this is a really important point that I don't have time to, but uh, time to talk about, I guess, right now. But um, the approach, in order to successfully um, realize a lot of these transitions, given that the faculty, um, st uh, staff, and students lean left overwhelmingly and are going to for the foreseeable future, just realistically speaking, if you want to make any of these movements actually effective, you're going to have to appeal to the norms, values, and priorities of the people that you want to convince. And this is something that a lot of people um, who are critical of a lot of the contemporary di dynamics aren't doing very well. I would like to talk about that more if people um, have questions about it. Uh, and frankly, um, it's important to just set expectations. Some of this stuff we can probably roll back. Some of these excesses we can probably <coughs> correct. But some things are probably going to stick around at the end of, the, at the end of this process. Um, certain things are not going to be rolled back. Um, uh, so I guess that's it for now. And happy to talk a little bit more. Down the line. <laughs>